Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The Role of Historians on Social Media. I'm very pleased to be joined by our lead scholar and guest tonight, Kevin Cruz from Princeton University. My name is Andy Mink, and I'm the Vice President of Education at the uh, National Humanities Center. Um, it's kind of strange to be speaking with you like this. This is the new normal, it seems. Uh, talking into microphones and into screens. Uh, I know that there are severe disruptions at universities and colleges and school districts all over the country. Uh, I hope that you're handling it well. I hope that uh, the students that you work with on a daily basis are uh, beginning to wrap their brains around, um, around the grief of loss. And by that, I mean the loss of experience, all the things that we precisely orient our lives to, whether it's the season of basketball or um, uh, spring break or SAT tests coming up or the prom. These are all things that are, are both anchors for our academic years, but also severe disruptions uh, when they're not there. And I know many of you are now trying to figure out uh, how to manage that with your schools, how to work with your students, perhaps in a long distance way. And one of those unspoken things, uh, I think for many students in this country who might be wondering where, uh, where their meals are gonna come from starting tomorrow. Um, or next week or after spring break. These are the kinds of things um, that uh, that you as teachers always have to think about. Um, so I'm very pleased that you can join us and perhaps take a break from that a little bit. Um, our conversation tonight is intended to, uh, to focus on a topic, but I have a feeling that our current context is gonna come into play uh, a little bit as well. Kevin, I see your note and yes, I'm gonna unmute you um, uh, after my introduction. I do want to thank uh, both Libby and Mike for all their hard work this week in particular. We've been uh, postponing and rescheduling and moving our own calendars around at the center. Uh, please do keep in touch with us through our Twitter handles or email. Um, the three of us are committed to providing whatever kinds of resources we can uh, to help you do your, your work with younger students in a better and more successful way. National Humanities Center is um, located in Durham, North Carolina, and we are, if nothing else, a spot of uh, humanistic uh, pursuit. We attempt to advance the understanding of the world through the work of the humanities and the scholars who join us each year in fellowship. Um, that does include the medical humanities and understanding the context of uh, events like the one that we're currently going through. I'm sorry, I'm gonna pause for just a moment. Uh, being pinged privately. Uh, can everybody hear me? If anybody, if you can hear my voice right now, please. Yeah, Rachel can hear me. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. I had somebody ask me if they could if they could hear, and it made me suddenly wonder that I was talking into a dead microphone. Thank you. Um, please do visit us at the center anytime you can. If you can't come to the center in person, please do join us through our website. We've worked hard to organize and index all the material, both in our scholarly programs and our education work so that you can find it easily, you can find it in a way that makes it accessible for your kids. If, for example, you go to our search function and you type in uh, disease or epidemic, you'll quickly come up with a recording of a pop-up webinar we did just a few weeks ago with Mary Wabel from University of Pittsburgh on how to contextualize uh, the current um, coronavirus uh, epidemic. And you know, being able to do that as an historian, being able to do that as a humanist, maybe maybe we'll provide some backdrop to the ways that we can uh, that, that we can approach this uh, this current pandemic. I've got a couple of announcements before we move on with our webinar tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to announce that our next scheduled webinar is titled "Slavery is Freedom: White Married Women and Slave Ownership in the American South," with Stephanie Jones Rogers from UC Berkeley, has been canceled. This is not due to any kind of personal health reason, but uh, the campus in Berkeley has been disrupted to a point where Stephanie's schedule just doesn't allow for her, her to join us that night. So please, if you had scheduled that, please take it off your, your calendar. I'd also like to note that we have other opportunities for you to work with us uh, coming up. On Monday, we're gonna open the application process for our Teacher Advisory Council. Uh, this is an annual cohort of educators, folks like Jenny uh, Snotty, who's in the room tonight, and Carl Rosen, who work with us uh, to help understand the ways that we can support the contemporary classroom. This is a one-year tenure, and it does include a two-day summit at the center where we bring you to North Carolina and reveal to you uh, the inner workings of the center so that you can become an advocate for and a collaborator with us. Uh, deadline will be Mar May the 4th, and we'll make announcements of next year's cohort sometime before Memorial Day. 
Also like to mention that we have online courses currently running. We have five courses happening uh, as we speak. We also have three additional courses that will be opening in just a few, uh, a few weeks. Um, these are five week courses that allow you to, in a more immersive way, work with scholars and primary sources on a variety of topics. Um, I do want to note to all of my LAUSD teachers in the room tonight that uh, these courses have been pre-approved for salary points. So, so should you choose to take one, it, it will earn you one salary point for each course taken. And then thirdly, I'd like to um, continue to remind you about the five-day summer institute that we have scheduled for the end of June. Titled Beyond February, Hip Hop and the African American Experience, we'll be working with artists in residence and uh, professor of hip hop at the University of Virginia, A.D. Carson, on ways that music and hip hop in particular can help access experiences and themes from the Af African American world. Um, we're limiting this at 36. Uh, we're reaching our capacity pretty quickly. So if you are interested, please do consider registering and joining us. And if you teach currently in any of the following districts, we do have scholarships secured. Uh, we approach donors in those communities and ask them to underwrite a teacher from D.C. Public Schools, District of Philadelphia Schools, Decatur Public Schools, Charlottesville City Schools, and Los Angeles Unified, as well as Charlotte Mecklenburg. And so if you uh, currently teach in any of those schools, then we will be um, offering a scholarship. Uh, those are due on April the 24th, and we'll make announcements just a few weeks after that. One last reminder about our webinar tonight. Uh, the conversation and the corresponding PowerPoint and the tone that we hope to strike could be very interactive. And that interaction is gonna come from you in the chat box. So as many of you already have, please introduce yourself, say hi in the chat box, but use that space to communicate with each other, to ask questions, to make clarifying remarks, to uh, heckle us from a distance. That's the place that I, as the moderator, will bring your voice to the conversation. And I do encourage you to use it um, and even overuse it, uh, should you choose. So this is um, my introduction, really, of what I think is going to be a pretty fascinating topic tonight. Um, I often talk in our webinars and in other work that we do about the, the ways that we apply the humanities to complicated problems that we're currently facing, both classic and contemporary. And I can't think of anything more contemporary than social media. And so I'm anxious to, um, to welcome to uh, the, the webinar series, Kevin Cruz from Princeton University. Um, I've got him on the screen. I've unmuted him, uh, so he's now got an active and hot mic. He's also got a very large number of followers on his Twitter handle. I would encourage any of you who are on Twitter right now, pull out your phone, follow him, maybe somehow bring tonight's conversation to that social media platform. I also want to mention that uh, a current Teacher Advisory Council member, Kevin Klein, is tonight's TA. Kevin is in the chat box. He is. Um, he will be making comments, he'll be responding to different things. I think Kevin's also pretty active on uh, social media and on Twitter, although he might not have uh, over almost half a million uh, followers. Hey, Kevin, can you hear me up in uh, Princeton? Yes, I can. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to give you the, the mouse and allow you to kind of walk us through the way that your career has evolved and your role on social media. If you don't mind, I'd like to start, though, with a question. and just a, a way to maybe set the tone for tonight in the format. And, you know, as, as the folks in our audience, these are all teachers of, of students of various ages, um, you know, as they, they likely consider your role in social media, someone might be thinking, what kind of historian is this? You know, what kind of full-time faculty is this if he's got time to spend on Twitter all the time? <laughs> but you, you've published a lot of great work. <laughs> you've, you are a conventional, traditional humanist at the same time. How, how in the world did you move from this world, the one with the titles of your, your recent books here, to, to being such a presence on Twitter? Well, first of all, Andy, thanks for having me, and thanks for all you've done to, to put this together, and, and thanks to Libby for uh, putting together these, uh, these images for the PowerPoint. Um, uh, it's really great to be here um, and, and to chat with folks. Um, I'd like to pretend that I had some grand plan that segued me from my uh, academic career to Twitter. Uh, but I really just sort of fell into it by accident. Uh, that um, uh, that second book you see on the list there, uh, One Nation Under God, uh, came out in 2015 uh, with basic books. And uh, I had a meeting with their marketing department about four or six months before the book came out. They said, we really encourage our authors 
to be on Twitter. And I hated hearing that. I uh, I was not on any social media, no Facebook, no Instagram, no anything. Uh, I didn't even have a cell phone until uh, 2022, uh, uh, 2002. <laughs> um, so uh, so I, I really was dragged into this uh, kicking and screaming. And I cannot stress enough at the outset here that I had absolutely no strategy going in and I still really have no strategy. Um, I, I've kind of been making this up as I go, but but I'm hoping tonight to be able to share some thoughts uh, with the folks here. Uh, and, and again, I want to kind of treat, treat this like a Twitter thread. I'm going to throw out a couple uh, short opening thoughts, I think, and, and then I'd really like to open it up for um, people to reply and uh, to give us uh, some some questions that hopefully I can I can help uh, steer us to. Um, uh, so, so Kevin, I, I very much appreciate that sense of, uh, you know, being out over your skis and sort of figuring it out as you go along. But I wonder if, as an historian, what kinds of skills do you have or did you bring professionally that allowed you to engage in social media so strongly? Is, it, is there a one-to-one -one relation? Is it, you know, Twitter is so ephemeral. It's so sort of in the moment and conversational. Um, was it an easy, an easy match once you engaged in that world? It became an easy match, but I'm not sure if it's because I was an historian as much as a, as, a, as a teacher. You know, I'm yeah. used to being approached by people who have questions about 20th century American history, whether they be undergrads or um, or, or, or journalists. Uh, many of them, I've, I've gotten a lot more questions from them now that I've been on Twitter. Uh, but asking me the kind of, you know, uh, basic uh, but sometimes complex questions about American history and having to... Uh, explain things to them in a uh, in a coherent fashion. Uh, and I think right. that really set me up um, for the approach of Twitter. Um, the actual writing of Twitter, no, actually, I think you know my training as an historian really works the other way. I spend you know five to ten years in an archive digging through boxes on my own and then craft these books which are you know three hundred pages long with deep footnotes. Um, that's about as far removed uh, from a from a Twitter thread as you can get in terms of its immediacy and length. So it's um, uh, it, it's been rather different. But I've done a lot of other kinds of writing. Going back to uh, when I was an undergrad, I wrote a column for the, uh, the student newspaper. Uh, I took a lot of poetry classes, which actually I think helped, a lot of creative writing poetry classes. It taught me uh, an economy of words uh, that I think, um, you know, Twitter is kind of like a, a series of haikus. So it, it sort of worked out well there. Um, but so I, I think I put together these these different skills I kind of accumulated on the way and Twitter um, uh, somehow I checked a lot of boxes that worked with it. So I, I, th I think that's what helped me there. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you again for joining us. I've given you control of the screen so you can advance the slides at your own pace. And again, I want to remind our audience tonight that Kevin Klein, teacher advisor, council member and current teacher at Franklin High School in Indiana will be in the room as a TA sort of making comments and offering his own thoughts. I believe Kevin runs a Twitter chat pretty frequently and I'd invite him to put that information in the box as well. Okay, we're good to go. All right. Again, thanks everybody for coming out um, or staying at home, I guess. Um, as I said in those opening comments, I had no strategy going into this and I, I still don't. Someone once asked me what my Twitter strategy was and I think I laughed for a full minute. Uh, I, I really have kind of been finding my own way here. Again, I got on early on because Basic Books strongly encouraged me uh, as one of their authors to be involved on social media. Uh, but I use it the way in which they had kind of explained it to me, that you've got to be on this basically uh, for press releases. You know, here's a review about my book. Here's an interview I did. Here's all this stuff about me. Uh, and, and I still do that, but if you treat Twitter like your personal set of pe press releases, nobody cares. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm that great. I don't think other people uh, do either. Um, so I quickly started to try to think of other things I could do on Twitter. And at first it was a very bland, um, on this day in history approach. Uh, and I would, you know, see the date and look up and think about, okay, on, on this day this happened and I know a couple of things about this and let me maybe post a document about this. And, and that was fine, but again, so what? Uh, you can find that uh, in, the, in a million places. There was nothing, I think, that really set that apart. Uh, as I fumbled my way through those modes uh, early on, um, I soon realized that Twitter really has to be a conversation. You can't simply be projecting things out into the void. You really have to be 
uh, listening as much as you are talking. Uh, I think that's true at any uh, level of engagement you're at. It's, it, it's harder when you have, when I have a lot of followers, I, I, I miss a lot of mentions. Um, they come in you know, by the thousand. Uh, but even then, I still try to listen and, and see what's going on in my mentions and, and, and talk to people and respond to people. Um, and I found this has been really good in two ways. It's been good for my engagement, um, certainly with other historians, historians who I would normally only see, you know, every year or two at a conference. Uh, and with the news today that the uh, the OEH uh, this year has been canceled, I'm not going to see them there. Uh, but I get to see them uh, all the time, uh, virtually uh, on Twitter. Uh, and get to exchange ideas uh, with them, get to exchange uh, tips with them. I've I've borrowed notes from syllabi and and, and teaching approaches and uh, uh, class ideas, uh, thinking about texts. Uh, it's really been great. It's also helped me reach out to um, uh, to other academics, uh, people who I would not have seen at a conference. You know, the sociologists and the political scientists are off in their own world, but I've uh, gotten a chance to really exchange a lot of uh, again, ideas and, and just get to know them. Uh, people I've, I've long admired their work uh, are on Twitter. And so I think the broader academic community, even beyond uh, historians, has, has really been great to know. I've also gotten to know um, uh, and engage with a lot of members of the press, uh, reporters, uh, and journalists I've followed for, for a while, editors um, who now reach out to me to, uh, to, to ask if I want to write something in a way in which I, it wouldn't happen before. Also, politicians I've gotten to know and Follow and have been followed by a lot of, um, uh, you know, congressmen and, and and folks like that, and and that's nice to have that kind of direct channel. I don't know if I'm talking to their aide or to the congressmen themselves, but but it's nice to have that um, uh, that path there. Um, but while it's been good for my engagement, I, I think the engagement more importantly has been good for me. Um, it's been good for my work, uh, in that um, uh, I can ask archival questions. You know, I could ask, you know, where is this? Does anyone know where this guy's papers are? Um, or, or you know, you often see on Twitter people will post a screen cap of uh, a screenshot of, of something that they can't decipher in the in the archives, whether it's a a reference to something they don't get, or or more often uh, a piece of handwriting they can't figure out, and and we kind of sort through it as a group. It's it's kind of great. Uh, I like to give book recommendations. If you if you uh, ever find an historian on Twitter, uh, and ask them for a book recommendation. We love telling people about the books that we like. Um, it's it's really nice. Um, uh, it's also helped my my research in some kind of fundamental ways outside of the academy. Um, you know, when I wrote uh, White Flight, uh, when I wrote that book, White Flight, that third one you see on the on the page there, um, it was really uh, a, a great experience. But it wasn't until the book came out that people wanted to talk about it, and I had all kinds of people who said, "Oh, that that student you write about in chapter five, that was me. Uh, I've got great stories." Well, it's too late, you know, or, or, oh, I used to live in that neighborhood you talk about in chapter three. Yeah, boy, I, I would have loved to have talked to you. Yeah, me too. It's too late. Uh, I'm doing a book now on John Doerr in the Department of Justice in the 1960s, uh, and I've gotten tons of people who've said, oh, my dad worked there, or, or we live next to them in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Let me tell you some stories about it. And I can actually go out and interview these people and talk to them, or they'll give me leads for, for papers. I've found um, uh, archival sources I never would have come across, uh, thanks to Twitter. So, so uh, I'm, I'm very thankful uh, with that. Um, but at an even more basic level, um, I think what Twitter has done for me and what I think it done for all Twitter historians, it's just really opened up our world uh, across the board in terms of our, our research, uh, our teaching, uh, our conversation with scholars and our conversations with the broader world. Uh, and, and as I said in one of those pieces uh, that I, I, I gave out as the materials here, I like to think of Twitter as kind of a, a global office hours right, uh, in which you're kind of open for all sorts of questions, just like your office hours you would have at a university or even a high school. Um, you get students come in the door and you never know what they're gonna ask. Uh, and it might be an incredibly arcane question or it might be something really broad, uh, but they're interested in something and, and thank God for that. Uh, and I love to be able to, uh, to engage with people. Um, I think for too long, um, not totally by choice, but like just from lack of access, a lot of historians have been kind of shielded off from the world, not in kind of an Ivy Tower um, snobbish exclusion, but just we, we lacked an audience. You know, we, we, we write these books uh, and they wind up um, sitting on a shelf somewhere. Uh, and if nobody picks them out and reads them, they're not doing anything. Um, uh, 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 Carl Becker had a great line about the, uh, the book that lies inert on a shelf does no work in the world. I'd like to believe that everyone is out there reading all my books. 
uh, I'm under no illusion that they actually are. Uh, but on Twitter, I can reach people and maybe point out some of the things I've talked about in my books or my teaching uh, and, and spread them to a broader audience. Uh, so about uh, probably six to eight months into Twitter uh, was when things started to change for me there. Um, uh, and it changed in terms of uh, what I was doing with Twitter and what people were getting out of what I was doing with Twitter. Uh, and I realized that Twitter could be used not just to answer people who wanted a response, but to answer people who needed a response, whether they wanted it or not. Um, and and this, this happened uh, really in the summer of 2015, in the fall of 2015, um, as a couple of national controversies uh, creeped up about Confederate monuments, uh, which spoke to some of my interest in Southern history, but also to uh, the, the start of the 2016 presidential campaign, um, where people in both cases were making claims about American history uh, that were simply wrong. And um, in the past, I would have simply uh, yelled at the TV. Um, and instead, I realized that I had this new um, piece of electronics uh, that I could use to um, uh, yell at the TV in a way in which the people on the TV might hear me. Um, and, and so a couple of these that happened early on and caught some attention uh, and showed me the real promise of this were, um, uh, one was an engagement with Kevin Williamson of National Review, who had made some um, uh, pretty egregious claims about um, civil rights history and partisan realignment, uh, the kind of stuff that I've frequently argued with Dinesh D'Souza on. This was an early version of that. Uh, and I did a response to one of his claims on Twitter that really took off. This is a, a, an article written about it in Talking Points Memo. Um, another one was when I saw um, uh, Joe Scarborough uh, tweet this in, in September 2015, calling Obama the most partisan president ever, which I just thought was flatly wrong. So as you can see here, I uh, had a little thread uh, about that, and again, this got some uh, some notice. I think this was written up in the um, uh, uh, New Republic, I think. Uh, and this showed me that oh, I wasn't just kind of typing these things into the void. People were really um, responding to this. And in fact, Scarborough uh, went up um, in later tweets. Clearly, had seen this, didn't respond to me directly, but started to modify his 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 claim. I thought, oh my God, if I can, I'm not just yelling at Joe Scarborough on the TV. I'm sending a message out there that's making him change what he's saying on the TV. So. That's great. Um, so, so let's do that. Uh, and this is ultimately how I saw uh, the, the first world change that, that, that I, and again, lots of other historians are on Twitter doing this exact same thing as me who'd been there before me. But what we wound up doing was just basically correcting the record. And this is really a vital job I think we have. Um, we have a specialized set of knowledge at our command, and I think we have an obligation to use it. Um, uh, as much as doctors have an obligation to push back on, you know, the anti-vaccine crowd or uh, climate scientists have an obligation to push back against the climate change deniers, uh, historians have an obligation to use their knowledge to push back on the people who are making these wild claims uh, about history, whether they're intentionally lying or simply spreading misinformation. We have a duty uh, to push back. Uh, now, I know we'll never completely win uh, this argument. Um, first of all, I know the people we're arguing against will never be persuaded. Um, uh, I see someone right now in the, in the Carl Rosen in the box has said, um, trolls are a massive problem on Twitter, especially ones that are widely followed like D'Souza. What's the best way we can hope to minimizing their detrimental impact? We're never gonna minimize their impact completely. Um, I know for one, he's never gonna suddenly see the light and, and say, oh, I was wrong. In fact, we've proven him wrong before and he simply shifted the goalpost repeatedly. Um, or, or he'll ignore the, the fact check and, and move on to make another claim. Um, I, I think it's simply, uh, I guess, too lucrative a, a business uh, the, the, to, to, to back down on. I know we're not going to change those people's minds. That's not the goal. We do this for the bystanders. We do this for the people on the sideline who may see a thread from someone like that and say, well, that doesn't seem right. Um, but unless we speak up and unless we challenge that claim and do so not from an argument of authority of simply saying, I'm an historian, you're wrong. Um, I start sometimes lead with that, but the real thrust comes with providing the evidence and showing, here you go, here's the actual evidence uh, that shows uh, why that's wrong. Unless we do that, um, uh, then that misinformation stands alone. 
right? And people are hungry for history. I think we all know that more and more these days. At whatever level we teach, they know we know they're hungry for American history. And I think we have an obligation to provide it. Otherwise, the American history people are going to get are the ones written by non-historians that you find at the airport bookstore. You know, it's going to be Bill O'Reilly and Brian Kilmeade and a thousand other people who do this for their own ideological uh, reasons, right? Um, and we have a duty, I think, to offer a counterpoint. And again, a lot of times it feels like we're mopping back the ocean, right? Uh, uh, and that this is the most useless activity we can do. But I would rather do that and, and realize it hasn't changed everything than sit back and do nothing. Uh, I think we've all got a duty to do that. And again, thankfully, there are uh, thousands of historians on Twitter and Facebook and other forms of social media who are doing this work. Um, and I'm, I'm very thankful to be part of kind of this uh, this zone defense we've we've developed um and i think these counterpoints are are really important you can see that in in uh one of the, the i think the most important piece i put in those the materials if you haven't read it i'd really encourage you to is that piece about um the clan bank how social media spread a historical lie uh, which is written by um, jen mendelson and uh, peter shulman uh, a genealogist and an historian uh who pushed back against this this clan bake uh, meme that you've seen all over the internet and did so incredibly effectively because the piece shows not only um, how they push back against it, but I think more interestingly it shows where it came from, how it spread, uh, and how these things can take off from some random person on the internet with no express knowledge created this image and it just took off as these things do. Uh, and uh, again, the lie gets it's gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its sh shoes laced up, but we as people who have the truth at our at our hands uh, at our disposal have to um, do what we can to get it out there uh, so that i think is is a great example of uh, of what we're trying to do so the last thing i really want to talk about before we open up to q and a is to really talk about uh, the how to the nuts and bolts of this how do you write a thread as we call it and again this is a form i borrowed you can see this one here uh, the scarborough one um, uh, I used to number them at the end. That's because I, the people I modeled it on, journalists, used to number theirs. I've given up on that. Um, uh, uh, I still try to count. You don't want to have too many. You don't want it to be, I think, more than 20. Otherwise, people are going to zone out. Um, but I, I stopped. I stopped actually numbering them. And hey, I don't think you need to. And also, it just it takes up valuable space. Uh, but how do you write a thread? Uh, well, I think the way to do it is to do it exactly as you'd write an op-ed. Uh, if you've ever tried to do that. You generally have about 800 words to maybe as many as 1,200, 1,500. You have a short amount of time uh, to get your point across. Um, and when you write an op-ed, uh, I've heard this phrase from countless editors at newspapers across the country, um, uh, uh, magazines too. Uh, they always tell you to imagine, and they use some variation of this phrase, an educated audience of non-specialists. In other words, Imagine you're writing to people who lack the specific expertise you have, but are really interested in the topic, right? Talk to them uh, uh, in a way that um, uh, doesn't use jargon, um, uh, that, that presents your argument clearly and concisely, that uses clear examples. Uh, and I think the mistake a lot of historians make is that when we get into the, when we write those books that you saw before, we're diving deep into a topic and trying to find something brand new. Whereas with an op-ed and Twitter, instead what we're often trying to do is to explain things that might seem obvious to our discipline, but are a little murkier to the general public, or perhaps contested when they clearly don't seem contested to us. It doesn't take a PhD in American history to say that the Civil War was fought over slavery, okay? Uh, but, but I do that sometimes because it needs to be said. Um, it doesn't take um, uh, you know someone at Princeton to lay out that the two parties basically switch sides on civil rights over the course of the 20th century. I spent a lot of time doing that though. Um, uh, and so it, it needs to be said, but, and so it, it may seem obvious to people in history. And again, I think, you know, uh, someone who passed AP US history could probably do a lot of what I do, um, uh, but, uh, but it still needs to be done. Another thing you do with an op-ed is you have to find a hook. That's usually the hard part for an historian writing an op-ed is how do you make your area of specialty uh, relevant? Well, the great thing about Twitter is that the hooks come by all the time. Um, uh, they're overwhelming. Um, they constantly present themselves. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities here. Sometimes I will respond, oh, here's the, the uh, how media spread is a historical lie. Sometimes I'll respond to um, uh, uh, something that is in my mind that I'd written out something else. This was a response to a 
um, or an expansion of a, uh, a book review I'd done for The Nation on Linda Gordon's terrific book on the, the second clan of 1920s. And I had some extra thoughts I wanted to put in. And so I did this, this thread that, that um, went up standing on its own. Most of my threads are though reactions to uh, tweets or public comments. This is where not having a strategy helps uh, a great deal uh, because so much of Twitter is actually reactive. Something will present itself and you kind of respond. You're, you're, you're almost like a fireman responding to, uh, to the alarm. Um, most commonly, of course, they are um, directly debunking a claim. Um, this is one I did that, um, that really took off um, uh, responding to uh, Dinesh D'Souza, um, wondering uh, if there were any uh, racist Dixiecrats who switched parties and became Republicans. Um, I, I gave a thread there that uh, I wound up you know, getting like almost 11,000 retweets and, and, and a lot of people quote tweeted this, so it was, it was even bigger than that. So this really took off. Um, occasionally though, I move beyond the simple fact checking of, of here's someone who said A, and let me show you why it's actually not A, um, to do something uh, that is a little bit bigger. Uh, and so this is a good example, I think, of one I did um, when President Trump referred to um, the uh, neo-Nazis in Charlottesville and the people who had come out to protest them as extremists on both sides. And I noted, um, uh, I'd actually just been teaching that week, Little Rock, in a class I teach at Princeton, uh, and I'd come across some documents about how um, uh, the NAACP had been uh, described as extremists on both sides. Um, and this is something that, that took off, I think were, you know, the Washington Post did a, a piece expanding on this, um, uh, the New York Times, Huffington Post, um, and I was kind of grateful to see this thing that I had literally dashed off you can see the thing I just put my kids to bed and, and kind of wrote this before I got down to what I thought was going to be my, my real work that night. Uh, and several articles came out. I think it helped change the way in which people were, were reading, uh, uh, to some small degree, Trump's uh, comments about the Klan. Um, another one I did was um, uh, this one on the left here about um, uh, how we count murders. Uh, this was a, a tweet Charlie Kirk had done. Um, uh, this is before he blocked me. Uh, about how there were only 13 un unarmed black people killed by cops in 2018. And I thought about that, that it, it echoed something I do in a lecture I give on, on lynching, about how um, uh, numbers, the kind of cold world of statistics, uh, can block the, uh, the actual true horror of lynching. So I use this as an example to talk about the way in which statistics um, uh, really mask uh, the horror of what we're talking about here. Uh, the one on the right was, uh, as you can see, a response to something Laura Ingram had done on um, uh, uh, demographics and uh, immigration restriction. And again, it called to mind things I'd uh, long talked about and read about on the 1910s and 1920s uh, and the second Ku Klux Klan and immigration restriction. Um, Oops. I'm this next one. I think you yeah. inadvertently, there you go. There we go. Great. Five or six in a row. There you go. Perfect, there we go. Um, yeah, I think I, I brushed across the, the mouse pad there, my apologies. Um, but there's one way, and, and I wanna use this last example to really drive this point home. There's one way in which a Twitter thread is so much more than an op-ed. Again, in an op-ed, you've got, uh, if you write in the New York Times, you've got 800 words uh, to make your point. Uh, and if you write for maybe a magazine piece, you might get um, 1,500, maybe as much as, 3,000 and a longer essay for someplace like The Atlantic or, or Harper's. Um, what I like about the Twitter thread is that unlike any of those, I not only have as much time as I want to write them, uh, but I can show my work. I think so much of what we do as historians is providing evidence and interpreting it for the general public and using it to demystify the things that seem incredibly foreign or abstract, right? The evidence really makes it come alive. I'm an archive rat. I live off evidence in my writing. Maybe this answers Andy's uh, initial question. I live off evidence in my writing, uh, and here I like to show the evidence that, that I that I found. Uh, and so here's an example from just one thread I did. This was a response to a segment on Fox and Friends, where Brian Kilmeade complained that Democrats are, quote, the ones who gave birth to the Ku Klux Klan, it was the Republicans up until the 60s that fought against racism, and somehow that narrative flipped. I was asking a question here about, uh, uh, this is sort of the, the classic question we often get on Twitter about people who invoke the very true Republican past as a defender of civil rights, 
uh, and use it to, um, uh, uh, to to wonder why the party isn't still the party of civil rights today. And of course, there's a, a series of events that happened uh, in the mid '60s uh, that that that, uh, that that caused the parties to to switch their stances on this, uh, both in internally and in the public's mind. And so, in this one thread. I just want to show you the kind of the variety of evidence I like to use if you're unfamiliar with the, the threads I've done. I think you get a sense of the various ways in which a single thread can bring together and bring to life the work that I think historians do that's that's so vital. Um, so one thing I do is, I do this all the time, screenshots of newspapers from the time. Um, and so uh, here I use, um, I think this drives home the point uh, of how civil rights leaders were opposed to the nomination of Barry Goldwater, the Republican standard bearer in 1964. Here's a piece um, uh, with um, uh, Martin Luther King. And this you can only see part of it here, but in the actual thread, you can click on this and read it for yourself, uh, the entire piece. I use screenshots of uh, secondary sources as well, uh, like books uh, and articles. Here's a, the first one is a screenshot uh, of a book by my former uh, PhD student, Leah wright Rigur. Uh, her, her book, The Loneliness of the Black uh, Republican, uh, which describes this tumultuous scene of the 1964 convention in which the delegates were harassed and one black man was literally set on fire. Uh, and the second one there is a great piece that uh, Matt Delmont at Dartmouth uh, did in the Atlantic uh, on the 1964 Re National Convention. Uh, it's got a quote in there where um, uh, Jackie Robinson, who had been a Republican for a long time, said, I now believe I know how it felt to be a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Again, these are very kind of powerful examples, but they're, again, they're ones from other people's works. And I can take a screenshot and show uh, a page or four pages of a book. I can show part of an article here and highlight the text if I need to. It, it helps uh, to bring them to life. And again, provide the links to this Atlantic piece. So if someone's interested in this little bit of Matt's piece I've shown here, they can follow that and read his entire article, which is fantastic. Another thing I do, obviously, um, to, to use images. Uh, it's, a, it's a visual medium. And so here's a, just a screenshot I found of, of the black vote for president over time. And again, I use this, it, it's hard to see here, but if you click on the original image and the original one, it, it pops out, you can see the dates on the bottom. You can see where it dips off down there, that real low point in the middle is 1964. That's where things, uh, things switch. Uh, another thing I like to do is to provide links to larger documents that I can't screen cap. And so here, I wanted to make a point about the change of the Republican Party platform between 1960, and they have this long detailed section on civil rights, again, over 1,200 words, and in 1964, it had only a few, few vague lines, 132 words. I mean, it's a massive drop in the attention the party is giving uh, to civil rights. Uh, and again, I've got two links here where you can go and you can read the entire uh, thing yourself. Um, I do um, uh, links to audio or video clips. Here's one with um, uh, that has two of them back to back. John F. Kennedy's Civil Rights Address uh, in June of 1963, introducing what became the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, and here is <coughs> LBJ talking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And then not to get too kind of meta here, you can actually provide links to other threads entirely. So I often do that, where if I brush on something I've already talked about, I provide a link to that thread at the end. Now, its evidence serves two purposes. First and foremost, it makes it come alive, you know, like we all try to do with our teaching. You know, the variety of your sources is really important in keeping your students' attention. The same thing is true on Twitter. It can't all be text. Uh, but just as important, in Twitter, where so much of these arguments kind of float out there free from their author, um, where so much of the arguments are he said, she said, who knows? Uh, providing this hard evidence like this and in overwhelming do doses uh, helps make an effective rebuttal to the very, very thinly sourced statements of misinformation that are out there. Um, I did a talk about this at Virginia Tech a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked me, why do you provide so much evidence? And I said, well, hey, that's, I like to show all I've got. Um, I don't show everything, but, but you know, try to give a variety of stuff. But also I kind of like to carpet bomb the original claim uh, into oblivion. Uh, and I think that's useful to provide as much evidence as possible. So it's not simply, oh, well, you gave that one point, let me argue about that. Flood the zone with all of the variety of evidence you can. Again, here are the platform, the videos, the newspaper clips. 
uh, the accounts from other authors that show it's not simply my opinion, the field itself believes this, really provide as much of that as humanly possible and show that these these original claims, which are often a single tweet or a, a, an unauthored meme uh, on the internet, just an image with a, a quote that might be made up, to show how wrong they really are. And to, again, put all this evidence in people's hands and say, don't trust me, this isn't an argument from authority of, well, I'm a Princeton historian, trust me, period, but rather to provide the evidence to say, you read this, come to your conclusion. And that's what I think historians really do well here, is to show people um, that, um, not just here's the evidence, but but how to work through it. It's what we do. So that's my opening comment. Question. Yeah. Let me ask you a quick question, Professor, and that uh, to stay on this topic of evidence, which you know many of our teachers are working with kids from elementary all the way up through the collegiate level about how to in interrogate and how to interpret uh, sources and evidence, and really focusing on showing kids that they can't say anything they want, but there's got to be some kind of evidentiary argument. In this case on Twitter, how do you go about citing some of the screenshots or sources that you provide? Um, is there a yes. way for that, that you, you can actually show where these documents came from in the same way that you're suggesting needs to be done? Yeah, I, and so uh, what I like to do is, so say for a newspaper, it's not on that one, but it's something I, I've done more and more often, is to provide the name of the paper uh, and the date so people can find it. Um, right. Uh, if it's an article, uh, I, I often use a, uh, use a hot link. Um, as you saw that with that Matt uh, a Delmont piece, you can give a link to something. Uh, if it's a, a book, um, some, sometimes I don't provide the, uh, the link to, um, uh, to Amazon. I think a lot of people have an opposition to Amazon. That's sometimes we don't because I can find it. Uh, but the Google Books is good. Uh, but just to provide this, uh, these links and, 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 again, put it in people's hands. Um, whatever possible I like to give. So you saw with the um, uh, the party and platform. Do, yeah. Those do you have things. examples then? Do you have examples, even some of the ones that you've shown in which you've provided evidence? Does it is it usually the case that whoever you're responding to then rebuts you with their own evidence? Or do they basically just sort of disappear from the conversation? They generally disappear from the conversation, or they provide um, a counterclaim without much evidence. Right. This is usually so. D'Souza is the one I, I've I've danced with the most here, um, just because of the sheer volume uh, of the claims he makes, uh, and he very rarely provides any kind of sourcing or any kind of citation, uh, and instead just makes a broad claim. Uh, and when I provide um, uh, all this evidence, usually he complains that I provided too much evidence, which strikes me as an odd complaint um uh, and then and then moves on without really responding to any of it right thank you so i'm, I'm ready for questions uh, if people have questions uh, you can type in the box um uh, kevin klein i think is gonna and andy are gonna are gonna handle them so please let me hear yeah thank you um Carl's making a fantastic uh, point here. Yeah. Carl Rosen, uh, just west of uh, Philadelphia, asks, uh, whom do you follow because they're both uh, ideologically not aligned with you and reasonable, i.e. very much worth listening to? Um, if listening is part of the real key to Twitter, it strikes yeah. me important to listen to people you don't like as much as the people you do agree with. Who do you, who do you follow that you don't like? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and... And I agree. I think if you're using Twitter as uh, just a way to, to talk with people who agree with you on every point, it just becomes an echo chamber and you don't learn anything. So for me, as someone who has spent so much of my career working on modern conservatism, one of the really interesting things has been to um, to follow and engage with people who were active in making that. Um, so I, I follow and I'm followed by people like... Um, Stuart Stevens, who was a, a big Romney advisor in 2012, um, uh, Steve Schmidt, Nicole Wallace, who were on the McCain campaign in 2008, uh, David Frum, uh, Bill Kristol. Um, and these are people, I'm, we're very civil, uh, 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 we're very civil on, uh, uh, on Twitter. Uh, back in the Iraq war in 2003, if you told me I'd be um, exchanging um, um, at least pleasantries with someone like Bill Crystal, David Frum, I probably would have laughed in your face. Uh, but uh, but today uh, we find ourselves um, at least aligned in, in, in how we view the current occupant of the White House. 
uh, and I think that helps. Uh, we would certainly disagree on any number of policy positions. Uh, we would argue all day long on Iraq or things that happened at the Bush administration. Uh, but um, it's been useful for me to hear their point of view. I follow a lot of um, uh, conservative scholars, uh, people at uh, think tanks like AEI, uh, Heritage. Uh, I also follow people um, far to my left. I follow a good number of, uh, I'm a, a kind of fairly middle of the road uh, liberal. I follow a lot of people on the, on the, to the left of me, a lot of socialists, uh, a lot of people who are uh, come at things from a, from a very different angle. And I find it really um, keeps me on my toes. I, you have to be ready for criticism, um, especially now in a political campaign. I get it from all sides. Uh, but I think it really does help um, both broaden my horizons and I think sharpen my arguments because I'm not simply um, talking with people who already agree with me. I have to really um, state my case uh, quite clearly. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, I suspect that when you engage with folks like that, part of part of what is appealing to them is the same thing in reverse, that you have evidence, you have, you know, a, it seems to be a reasonable construct for what you're responding to. And it's not really about agreeing, it's about being able to have this kind of civil discourse, um, which is kind of odd to say. It's a, there's, there's some tension between using that term civil discourse and social media. Um, do you find that Twitter is is primarily for you a professional venue? And if so, um, you know, are there other parts of your professional life that you also use it? Do you use it in your teaching with your students at Princeton? Uh, do you use it, um, you know, not just to respond, but to maybe maybe start some of these conversations? Mm -hmm. I, actually, I don't use it in teaching, uh, and I, I and I reason I don't. Uh, although people have used my threads in teaching, I, I don't use it a because I'm I'm there myself and I'm able to actually make the argument I think uh, clear in person. I love when people use these threads for teaching. It, it, it's the greatest compliment I've, I've ever gotten. Someone has found this useful uh, in the classroom. Um, but my own Twitter thread, if you read it, um, I quickly realized um, that when I tried to just approach it solely as the professional version of me, uh, it it didn't feel right. It, it felt phony. Uh, and so I'm very open, uh, not just in my political opinions, but with, I talk about music and movies and other things like that on there. It's kind of all my interest. Um, I find that that's, that's the way you, most of us are on Twitter. So uh, it felt weird to kind of only be half of me on there. Um, so it's both a personal and professional. I still cringe a bit when I find out my own students are following me um, because I know they're seeing more of me than I would normally give them in the classroom, uh, but that's uh, uh, that's just the price of it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you think of a of a thread or uh, an argument you made that you have deleted that you just went back to and thought this is not where I want to be standing on this? Oh, that I've deleted. Um, usually not the threads. The threads stand alone. Oh no, I had one. Yeah, I had one early on. Um, about the vote in the Civil Rights Act of '64, where I had actually grabbed the wrong, uh, the wrong record, and had reported the numbers wrong, and immediately was horrified, uh, and and went back and and deleted and retracted and then did a thread yeah. again. Um, uh, I understand why Twitter doesn't have an edit function, but it can be really uh, a pain in the butt when you realize that this this is one tweet in the middle of a longer thread. I had to delete the entire thread and redo it because I had this. This one fact was just was just wrong. Um, most of the things I've deleted are, uh, I would say, more the moments where I'm not acting professional, where I, you know, I, I get mad at, at a troll or something like that, and I feel bad about it later on. I'll go back and delete some of those. <laughs> troll shame, I like it. Right. Um, we've got a good question here from from Jenny, who's down uh, just outside of Atlanta. Um, you've talked a lot tonight about using Twitter to clarify and to simplify. But sometimes teaching history or being a historian is making things messy. Um, have you found ways to also complicate history through Twitter? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so um, part of part of the clarifying process is to show people how complicated things are. Uh, and this is a kind of a running gag among uh, uh, the, the the Twitter historians, the historians on Twitter, uh, is that one of the things we say over and over again is is well, it's complicated, or yeah, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. So if you go back and look at that um, uh, that thread I had on uh, on the Klan in the 1920s, the whole point of it is not is that this idea that there was that there was once 
the Democrats were the party of the Klan and then the Republicans were the party of the Klan isn't true at either end, really. I mean, if you look maybe at the very fine endpoints of the start and where we are now, sure. But at that point in the 1920s, the point I make in that piece is that it is the both parties are involved in this. It depends on where you go. And so if you look at the South, uh, where uh, Democrats are the party of white supremacy, the Democrats naturally align themselves with the Klan. If you go to the North, where Democrats have a, a strong presence of, of immigrants and Catholics and Jews and, and African Americans, well, the Republican Party is the party that they align with. So in Indiana, uh, the biggest state for the Klan of the 1920s, it's aligned with the Republicans. Down South, it's aligned with Democrats most often. And so the whole point of that thread was it's not either or, and I make this point explicitly in that thread, anyone who's telling you it is simply 100% this or 100% that is wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, we did this in a, in a, uh, a thread uh, where D'Souza had talked about how there were zero Republican slaveholders in, nine, in 1860. And we quickly were like, no, that's not true. I mean, the Democrats were overwhelmingly the party of slavery, but anytime someone tells you something is 100% this or 0% that, they're usually wrong. So we use that as a way to say, look, there actually were a couple slaveholders, some pretty prominent ones. Uh, the head of the 1865, uh, 1856 convention and a, and a major delegate in 1860, Francis uh, Blair was one of them. Uh, look, there were some pretty significant people here who were slaveholders. It doesn't change the overall picture of it. Democrats were the party of slavery, but anyone telling you that it's 100% this or 0% that is, is usually wrong. History is messy and complicated. So yeah, we use these threads to make that point all the time. That's a great question. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I wonder too. You, you know, I, I suspect this is because of your your interest, your background, your specialization. Uh, but you've talked a lot tonight about a domestic Twitter. Is there an international realm to this as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the, you know, the, the domestic issues I write about, I find people internationally are interested in. Um, so threads I've done on. Uh, on civil rights, for instance, I did one before the 2018 election on kind of the martyrs of voting rights that that really got a lot of play around the globe um, uh, was was big. There are also scholars working abroad uh, who are engaged in this, and uh, and again, we we kind of all work together. So when say uh, questions come up about the Nazis, that's another constant topic here in America. It's often scholars from Germany. Uh, who are leading the way, or a couple in England uh, who who work on this, who really speak out against this. Um, uh, and there are uh, folks who work on, um, uh, I've seen ones on um, uh, African historians working on colonialism, uh, European historians working on all sorts of uh, both uh, socialist politics to to fascism. Uh, I just had a, a an Italian scholar uh, put out a great thread on, on fascism earlier uh, today uh, that I retweeted. Uh, so, so there, it, it certainly is a is a global effort, um, uh, and a lot of people are working on these these issues in their own ways. Yeah, thank you. I've got a question here from Mark Miller who asks. Um, I'm going to rephrase a little bit, Mark. If I put words in your mouth, and please correct me in the chat box. But, but essentially, you know, Twitter or social media, any kind of social uh, media platform, might be seen by your colleagues by. Um, your peers, your administration as being uh, waste of time, superficial. Um, how do you make a case for this being taken seriously by your department heads, your administration, other colleagues in the field? Do you worry about that? I do worry about that. Uh, um, and it's something that I used to shy away from. When colleagues used to tell me that they followed me on Twitter, I got embarrassed because um, mm -hmm. it felt like not real work. Or felt like a distraction from my real work. You should be, you know, writing another article or, or doing more work on your book, not wasting time on social media. But I really came to believe in its importance, uh, and I think that the way in which we can make the case for this, um, and, and I should say this is one of the reasons that I, I do what I do is that I know I'm in a fortunate enough position, right? Uh, and and it, part of it is is being a full professor at Princeton. Um, uh, where I've got the institutional um, of support and the, the kind of prestige of this place behind me. Part of it's also just who I am. Uh, I'm a um, cis het white Christian Southerner. I mean, I've I've got about every you know box checked for for a lot of people who would, would come at anyone who didn't check all those boxes. And so I know I've got a lot of privileges other people don't, and I have no excuse uh, not to do this. Um, so that's one of the reasons I do it, but but more and more I've realized that um, given where I am, um, I and other people who are at high profile places, so look at say, you know, Joanne Freeman 
uh, at Yale or Heather Cox Richardson at, at Boston College, um, folks like that, that we've got an obligation here to show what can be done with this and to make our institutions and the field as a whole uh, really come to appreciate and recognize this. I get requests to, to tweet things out from Jim Grossman, the head of the American Historical Association, all the time, and I'm happy to do it. Uh, same with the OEH. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do it, to, to use this platform uh, to reach a broader audience. Again, it took me a while to overcome that kind of natural feeling that this wasn't, quote, real work. It wasn't until uh, a year ago when somebody finally asked me why my Twitter handle wasn't on my CV, but I was like, oh, right, that should be on there. I right. think this is real work and I need to treat it like that. I used to shy away when people wanted to do uh, interviews with me. A, I didn't think I'm that interesting, but but B, uh, uh, I was kind of embarrassed by it. But I did a piece you know, with the Chronicle Higher Education, uh, which uh, I think gives uh, legitimacy uh, to what we do and, and a couple other places like that. Uh, I'm doing this here today. I think the fact that the National Humanity Center is valuing what historians do on social media says a lot. And so I think the more in which we do this, the more in which we take pride in our own work and treat it as real, I think that our institutions will too. Now, again, I come from a place of incredible privilege, both in where I am uh, and where I'm at in my career. And I know that not everyone is a full professor at a place like Princeton. And so my concern right now is that people who are in more precarious places, uh, tenure track uh, assistant professors, graduate students are on the market, uh, people who might be teaching at a, at a public high school um, uh, don't have the protections I have, uh, and 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 the way in which Twitter works, there can be immediate backlash. Um, I know if somebody you know sends a hate mail, uh, hate email to my my chair, he's going to shrug it off and probably offer to buy me a drink. I know a lot of people don't have that privilege uh, and and that protection, and I think that we as scholars need to talk to our institutions and our larger uh, academic networks and really make sure that we're looking out for the people who need looking out for. Again, I or any full professor, any tenured professor is gonna shrug off the complaints, but if somebody comes after a graduate student and they've done this, uh, it can lead to the end of their career um, for what they've done on Twitter. Um, so I think we need to both recognize the value of what people do on Twitter, but also the costs that can come with them. We need to be careful and protect those people who are most vulnerable in our profession. Yeah, it's funny. I was going to ask you that that question, and I, I'm going to ask it anyway. I think and let you uh, amplify your answer, and that is, you're you're approaching this at the at least at the middle of your career, <laughs> um, certainly in an established place. Do you recommend to your graduate students to develop a record or um, you know some sense of presence in social media to advance them, or do you advise them to? sort of lay low until they have that kind of protection? I, I've encouraged, I've got one student in particular I'm thinking of that I, I've tried to drag kicking and screaming on social media. He's an incredibly social guy, he's a total extrovert, but for some reason he's not on that. Um, uh, just And just solely to, to make the connections. Uh, I think there's a real value in being on Twitter to uh, meet uh, people who are working in your field, to introduce your work to them, to promote it, if need be, and then I can promote them too. Uh, I, I like to, uh, whenever possible, um, uh, uh, give praise to the work done by my former and current students, um, and I like to promote that as much as, as much as I can. Again, I've got this stupid platform. Let me use it to talk about the people whose work I admire the most, who are usually my students, who I've, who I've seen kind of in the trenches. At the same time, I always caution them um, to really be careful on Twitter because they, you know, they're going to be on the job market. They're going to be up for something, and um, and when I don't want anything here held against them. I don't want them, um, you know, I don't think Princeton would um, uh, uh, wind up acting against a graduate student in the way in which some public universities have. But but I, I don't want to put them in that position. So I I urge them not to be as you know not to quite follow my model uh, and mm. be as as engaged uh, and as I am with some high profile people. Uh, that they might be criticizing because they're going to get blowback for that. Uh, but I do like, I do think they should be on the platform just as a way to kind of uh, uh, to, to introduce themselves uh, to the profession of the general public. It's, it's I think, nice to, uh, it's a nice way to form connections with, uh, especially in my field of 20th century U.S. history, with reporters who are always interested in these things, who might be looking for people to write op-eds, right? It's an easy way to, to, to kind of have a, you know, a virtual business card out there. 
Yeah, and it, it strikes me at the beginning of tonight's session, you talked a lot about connecting with other experts, folks that you wouldn't necessarily bump into the hallway at a history conference. It allows you to follow and be followed by uh, prominent um, players in much of the history that you write about and think about. And so I wonder, and now I'm going to try to map this onto some of the even younger students, students of our audience tonight, high school, and maybe even middle grades. So they may not be there to push back. They may not be there to get into a evidentiary argument, but just to follow and to read and to see where yeah. you know, these prominent names are falling on dif different topics. It seems like it might be a good um, indirect uh, sort of secondhand smoke that they can participate in. Yeah, but but, but in a healthy way. I, and I've, yeah. had, I've had a number of, of people who teach, you know, um, especially at the high school level um, uh, who are, uh, you know, uh, touching on these things and interested in, you know, the, they it uses that kind of continuing education, right, as a way to to brush up on something they're interested in, or or to, to find a book uh, that they might use, uh, or a documentary, or, or you know, it, just general sources. I've had people, um, you know, as I said, some people use the threads in the classroom because they're they're you know they're aimed at a general audience like an op-ed, and 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 that kind of counts for for their students, and they've used them to. You know, make some points about how do you interrogate evidence, right? And so, um, kind of basic things we do as an historian. If I've given an illustration of that in a thread, uh, people have told me that they've they've used it to good uh, to good effect in the classroom. And again, nothing gives me uh, more joy than hearing that. Absolutely. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and extend this question one more time, which is, do you think that your colleagues then do they have an obligation as experts in the field to to be active in Twitter the way you've described. No, no judgment, just an obligation yeah. to the profession. I think we have an obligation to be engaged in some form. And I'm yeah. not gonna say it has to be Twitter because I, a, I, know, you, I'm, I know a lot of my colleagues aren't quite tech savvy um, uh, to, to handle the, uh, the medium, um, uh, but I know some just don't have the, uh, the personality. The, the, Twitter can be very confrontational. Um, you have to have a thick skin, you have to be, willing to, you know, um, everything from random jerks yelling at you in the, in the replies to, I get crank emails, I've gotten threats. Um, and I know a lot of my colleagues aren't cut out for that. And I, I get that. I'm not going to demand that of anyone. But if they're, you know, writing op-eds or appearing uh, on on the radio or, or, or cable TV and offering their expertise there, great. I just think in some form or another, we have a duty to uh, to offer what we have to the general public. And I think we have a desire to do that too. We all are in this, not to, we don't, very few of us, appearances aside, are hermits, right? We wanna be engaged in the public. We, we write these books hoping people will read them. Uh, and if they don't pull that actual book off the shelf, uh, then we need to find a way to get that, that material into their heads another way. And that, whether that's Twitter or Facebook or op-eds or, articles or radio appearances or whatever, we've got an obligation to do that. So uh, I wouldn't say you have an obligation to be on Twitter, but I think you have an obligation to be out there in some form. Yeah, that's a great point. And so Twitter becomes the, for you, it becomes the medium of choice for John Meacham. It's being on the news in the morning, uh, the yeah. talk shows. And, um, you know, we're yeah, all trying to- I, I get invited yeah. to be on, I get invited to be on TV all the time. I don't have the patience yeah. for it. Um, right. Usually a TV appearance, uh, I got asked to be on MSNBC all the time on Sunday morning, and they would say, "We'll send a car for you." Okay, so that's I leave the house at 6 a.m. I get to New York 7:30. You do makeup for, you know, whatever it takes to make me presentable on TV. I'm then on for five minutes, and then yeah. take the car service back home. I mean, I've blown half my Sunday. You know, I've got a working spouse and two kids. That just didn't seem useful to me. Uh, even when I do a remote hit here from Princeton, it's a, it's a lot of work to prep for those things in a short amount of time, and I just I just don't have the patience for it. My colleague Julian Zelizer practically lives on CNN. He he lives in literally lives in New York, so he's not far from the studio. He he's made for it. He loves it. That's great. Uh, other people do podcast or radio. I I do the radio all the time because I can do it from my home. I don't have to shave for the radio, uh, so right. it's very easy. Um, well, and I but think, each yeah, I think find our own form. I think these webinars, you know, we do almost 40 a year with humanists yeah. from all disciplines. And I think the, you know, I rarely get someone to decline. And I think it's for the same reason, right? It's it's reaching an audience. It's being engaged with the public. It's offering expert commentary um, on some complicated topic. And so yours is Twitter and there are all these others that 
we're suggesting it is an obligation to having those uh, that that knowledge base. Yeah. Got a question here from Kevin Klein. Kevin's our TA tonight, uh, teaching in Indiana. Kevin asks, what thought process do you encourage in Twitter speak? There's often a different feeling speaking in person and speaking on Twitter. Oh, that's a good question. Um, one thing I do, I do shift my thinking when I'm when I'm writing on Twitter is, uh, especially when I'm doing a thread, is I've learned that each thread has to stand on each tweet. The thread has to stand on its own. Um, I see people who do threads where they treat it like you know, like they're they're hitting return on a typewriter carriage, and they just write to the end of a, and then you know they'll till the end of a. a, a a tweet in mid sentence and then pick it up in the middle of the sentence of the next tweet. You can't do that. Um, also, because it, it, it's incoherent, but also any one tweet might be screenshotted and 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 pulled out and represented on its own. So you've got to make sure it can stand on its own two feet. Uh, so I tend to think in terms of um, bite-sized chunks that stand on their own, but also make sense uh, together. Um, uh, and that is a certain style of writing that um, that again I think I. I, I had already learned uh, as an undergraduate doing a lot of creative writing poetry, but there's a certain kind of form of a stanzas. And I kind of treat each tweet as a stanza in a larger poem where I'm fine if it gets plucked out, but it makes a lot more sense uh, if they're all coupled together. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kevin Klein. Um, you've talked a lot about the ways that social media, that Twitter, this engaged medium has been uh, an extension of your role as an historian. It's a way to comment on the world. We've we've worked through that, uh, but there is a very high profile example of how Twitter, many might say, has been used uh, inappropriately. It's it's really it's wormed its way into our discourse in a way that not before 2015, 16. Um, I don't ask this as a political question, but I ask it more as a uh, sort of an evaluation of the way that President Trump uses Twitter in terms of policy, in terms of announcements. Um, what, what's your take on that as an historian? Yeah, you know, it's remarkable. When we, uh, when Julian and Delzer and I wrote the book Fault Lines, we we started it, uh, we started writing it out of a course we did first in 2012 on the U.S. since 1974. We started writing the book in earnest in probably 2014, so before Trump had even announced. But Trump, in a lot of ways, brought together some of the themes that we talked about in the book. And there are two major themes. One is the kind of increased polarization of our politics, and the other is the way in which new forms of media increasingly fragment the public comments. Well, President Twitter um, really brought those two points uh, mm -hmm. to a head. And so I see Trump's use of Twitter in the same way, uh, not the same way, but the same continuum as we see, say, Roosevelt's mastery of radio, FDR's mastery of radio with the fireside chats, uh, Kennedy's mastery uh, of television, uh, the way in which uh, cable news came to dominate uh, the Clinton uh, and then the George W. Bush years, uh, that the, the medium really does uh, shape the politics of the moment. And so uh, what it's done for Trump is it has really uh, allowed him to, um, uh, it, it lets him do anything that it lets the rest of us do, which is to uh, throw ideas in the public sphere. But because he's such a big figure, uh, when he tweets, uh, they're literally doing, you know, uh, suddenly news reports about things he's thrown out. Um, I've, I've had tweets appear on the news, but usually it's just kind of as an, as an aside. I'm not changing the agenda because he's the president. If he tweets about it, it becomes news. And sometimes he tweets about things that are half-baked ideas that I don't think he's really thought through. And suddenly the media is treating these suggestions uh, as if they're formal policy announcements. We saw this on trade. We saw this on the Muslim ban. Um, you'll see him tweet things out. Uh, that'll widely uh, affect how we're doing the the, the coronavirus preparation or the um, uh, or what's going on with the stock market, right? And so there's a real danger in that, in that kind of immediacy. Uh, but the kind of filter a president would normally have had, again, Roosevelt had a radio script he set up and then sat down to deliver it, a script that went through several rounds of vetting. Kennedy's press conferences, there were lots of briefing notes on that, that he knew what he was talking about before he went in. Uh, with Trump on Twitter, it comes straight and unfiltered. There's no aid in the middle there, uh, and so that I think is uh, is we're getting kind of a a, a raw feed into the president's uh, 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 inner monologue, uh, and that's both revealing, but also I think can can be a little too much. Uh, so I'm not sure um, uh, uh, how best to deal with that. That's 
probably in other fields uh, expertise. Uh, but I do think it's a remarkable change and one that um, that we we've, we've certainly had to reckon with. Great, thank you. And what other questions do we have? We have just a few more minutes in tonight's session. Other questions from our audience, please do type them into the chat box. We'll be happy to bring them to Professor Cruz. Um, sticking with uh, with the president's Twitter, um, is it your sense to them that, I don't know the numbers, I don't know the percentage of, of Americans or percentage of voting eligible Americans are actual Twitter followers, uh, actually use Twitter. And of those, that percentage, how many of them actually follow the president? Yeah, I don't know what the are numbers are. actually for... reading his tweets, or are they just reading the, hearing the news about his tweets? I think they're just hearing the news about his tweets. And again, yeah. you don't have to follow. I don't follow Trump on Twitter. I don't know why anyone does. There are anytime he tweets something, there are forty people will retweet it immediately or quote tweet it. So it gets out there. There's no need for you to personally follow him. It just inflates his his numbers and his sense of his importance. Um, uh, but you do see them all over the news again. Uh, you know, not just on Fox, on CNN, on on MSNBC. Uh, again, because they are, uh, according to official government policy, they are pronouncements from the White House. His tweets count as though as if it was a press release issued by the White House. Now, there's actually a Twitter feed that takes all of his tweets and mocks them up as White House press releases, and it's striking to see them that way. But that's how they come out. Right. I've got a couple of good questions I'd like to bring to you. One is from Carl uh, Rosen. He asks, um, first of all, he makes the comment that you have a pin thread on your Twitter feed that provides easy access to your greatest hits. Uh, this is your live record, your live album. Um, mm -hmm. But you've got a lot in there. And he's asking for, in your opinion, what's a deep cut from that cruise archive that you wish had gotten more play, especially because you enjoyed writing it or because you found it particularly important? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I love all my children. Uh, <laughs> I can't really pick a favorite. Um, I would say, I mean, I think um, what, what's, what, I think this goes to the combative nature of Twitter. If it's a dunk I did on D'Souza, it gets a ton of play because I found people really don't like him. I've done other Twitter uh, threads that you'll, you'll see in there. I can't think of a specific one now, but I know they're in there that I put just as much work into, but because they are simply off an idea I had or something that was else in the news that I just responded to that didn't get quite that level of play because it wasn't me dunking on D'Souza and everybody being like, oh, look at this. Um, so I wish the ones that didn't have the kind of public embarrassment uh, of, of the person I'm responding to, uh, I wish those had maybe gotten a little more uh, a play. So he's your Lex Luthor. So, uh, you know, it, it's always good to have that kind of villain in the in the discussion, it sounds like. Um, Jenny Snoddy asks, is there a simple way, I think this is a sort of a technical logistical question, is there a simple way to link to some of your Twitter threads if she wants to post them on her blog while she's quarantined uh, or um, use them in teaching from afar, particularly because, you know, the truth is kids, kids aren't really on Twitter. You know, if you were Kevin Cruz of uh, Instagram or Kevin Cruz of Snapchat right. or TikTok, you'd you'd have the young vote. But right. uh, Twitter, Twitter's for the older folks. So how how does she uh, somehow link to your Twitter thread so she can share them with her kids? Well, there used to be an app, a, a website called Storify, that would put them all on a, on a web page. There's another place called Thread Reader app. It's all one word. Uh, and if you look there, you'll find uh, that a lot of my threads have been put on there. And if there's one that you like that hasn't been put on there, you simply type at the end of it, you respond on Twitter, thread reader app, you, know, you find the app, I think it's like uh, like that. You do that and unroll. And if you type that at the end, it automatically takes all of the, the tweets, puts them into a single web page, uh, and you can then provide a link to that. That's fantastic for a teaching tool, particularly. And of course, Jenny's responding to the um, to the likelihood that many of us will be teaching long distance uh, for the next couple of weeks, at least. But to be able to take that thread and to unroll it so that students can both analyze and maybe annotate the the conversation, the back and forth, yeah. maybe spend time with uh, with the with the evidence as it's revealed through the the linear nature of the thread. That's fantastic. Thank you. Other questions for tonight. Thanks, Kevin. My pleasure. Well, I've got one last question for you. We're almost out of time. Um, I, I heard you mention that you have children. Um, 
are they on social media? Are they old enough to be in this social world? No, no, they're they're, they're uh, eight and twelve, um, so they're they're thankfully too young. They know yeah. dads on Twitter, yeah. mostly because um, uh, they know um, like uh, Chris Evans, Captain America follows me, and they think that's that's cool. Uh, but it that's is about cool. It. <laughs> Fantastic. How do you get that blue uh, check mark? By the way, how do you get verified on Twitter now? I, I think they changed it. It used to just be that it's verified that you are who you say you are, that you're someone of some kind of in the public sphere, and you used to just click on a form, and uh, people kept telling me to do it, until finally I said, fine, I'll do it. Um, and you you just write into them and say, and so I said, I'm a historian at Princeton. I write op-eds and essays in the public sphere. Here's who I am. And you give them a phone number that would verify it, and that was it. It was very simple. And so all the people who think that it's like, some kind of you know, Illuminati club that we're all in. Uh, it, it ain't. Uh, it's just that you know, it, it means that if you see the name Kevin M. Cruz, this is the one that's really me. God forbid, there's someone who would. I can't imagine someone doing a, a parody account of me. That'd be the most boring thing imaginable. But but this just shows it's me. That's it. So it'd be Kevin Cruz, uh, Kevin Cruz's cow, or something like that. Like right. Kevin right. <laughs> right, right. So. Any last questions for Professor Cruz tonight? Thread Reader app. Got one more here, Kevin Klein. Uh, I think with the time I'm yeah. checking out, this will probably be the last question of the night. Kevin Klein asks, going back to the sense of obligation and um, and role that historians and humanists play, what should history teachers at the secondary level be doing? Um, is there an obligation? Uh, does, does it trickle down, or is it also incumbent upon? teachers at the secondary level, uh, community college educators, um, administrators. Uh, what? How, how do you imagine that that affecting others who are in this business? I think they're already doing it. Uh, I think the work that uh, 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 people at secondary level are doing, uh, community college, you're in the trenches. You are hitting people who uh, are, that may be the only history they get uh, in high school or, or, or junior high or maybe the community college. Uh, and you are giving them um, in the classroom. That's the obligation. Uh, you, so you're already fulfilling it. It's the rest of us uh, who are off um, uh, maybe the, the, the colleges and universities who, who only deal with a handful of students who seek us out and want us to teach them. We're not really confronting people like that, right? Um, so um, we have an obligation. I think, uh, I think y'all are doing enough already. I mean, feel free to speak up, but I, but I'm not going to say that you have to do more. I think you're already doing a hell of a lot. Yeah, that's a great point to end on. Uh, I want to echo Carl Rosen by saying thank you very much for joining us and for your online defense of facts. This is really a world that oftentimes seems uh, very inhospitable to them. My pleasure. I also want to thank uh, all of our audience for joining us tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Um, I understand again that you are working in some pretty complicated times and probably thinking about ways to uh, to work with your students in long distance uh, means. If any of the recordings or the National Humanities Center media can help you with that, uh, please do use our free and open archives. All of our webinars are recorded and available. Um, right now they're all there in full, but we are working to segment them by topic. So Rather than having a 90 minute recording, you might have four or five 15 minute recordings. You can also uh, access them and do that uh, editing work yourself. But if you have any kind of need over the next uh, couple, three weeks and month while you're working through long distance, please let me know and I'm happy to, uh, to, to mine our archive to help you out. Also, I would invite you to follow uh, the National Humanities Center on our own Twitter handle, as well as our Facebook page and our website is a place where you can sign up to receive reminders and notices of upcoming events. Um, I hope all of you are uh, safe. We're in your home communities. I hope your schools weather uh, this pandemic that we're currently uh, going through. I hope to also see you at our next uh, Humanities in Class webinar series. Again, next week's session with Stephanie Jones Rogers has been canceled. Our next session then is on March 24th. We'll be working with Molly Warsh from University of Pittsburgh. The title of the uh, session is More Than Pirates, Cruises and Rum. The History of the Caribbean in Global Perspective. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to open up a end of session evaluation. Please do take a few moments to complete it. And once you've done so, you'll be able to download your certificate of attendance. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, please be safe. We hope to see you again at the next Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everybody.